built between 1220 and 1260 in honour of Ireland's patron saint, St. Patrick's Cathedral offers visitors a rich cultural experience and is one of the few buildings left from medieval Dublin. St. Patrick baptised Christian converts on this site about 1500 years ago. St. Patrick Church. While the church was founded in 1191, the construction on the current cathedral did not begin until around 1220. I don't know why they would have merchandise inside the church. It's kind of strange, right? Aqui tem uma loja aqui dentro do templo aqui na igreja. É estranho. In 1300, Richard de Ferings and Archbishop of Dublin made an agreement for St. Patrick and Christ Church cathedrals. The Passus Compastio acknowledged both as cathedrals and made some provisions to accommodate their shared status. In 1311, the medieval University of Dublin was founded here with William de Rodyard, Dean of St. Patrick's, as its first Chancellor, and the Canons as its members. It never truly thrived, however, and was quashed at the Reformation, leaving the path free for Trinity College to eventually become Dublin's premier university. The collapse of the nave and the demotion to the status of parish church were just two of the effects of the Reformation on St. Patrick's that Henry VIII had much to answer for. Though in 1555 a charter of the joint Catholic monarchs Philip II of Spain and Mary I restored the cathedral's privilege and initiated restoration. In 1560, one of Dublin's first public clocks was erected in the tower. This lab right here is over a thousand years old. In 1492 to families, the Butlers and the Fitzgeralds began fighting over a high-level position inside the region. The fight escalated and the Butlers took refuge in the cathedral. When the Fitzgeralds came to ask for a truce, the Butlers were afraid to open the door. So the Fitzgeralds cut a hole in it and their leader offered his hand in peace. The two families then reconciled and adversaries became friends. By the 19th century, St. Patrick's and its sister Cathedral Christ Church were both in very poor condition and almost derelict. The major reconstruction was finally paid for by Benjamin Guinness III, son of Arthur Guinness, to between 1860 and 1865, and was inspired by the real fear that the cathedral was in imminent danger of collapse. In 1871, the Church of Ireland was disestablished and St. Patrick's became the national cathedral. These days, the cathedral hosts a number of public ceremonies, including Ireland's Remembrance Day ceremonies. For many years, legendary Dublin writer, poet and satirist Jonathan Swift was dean of the cathedral. As dean for over 30 years between 1713 and 1745, he wrote some of his most famous works during his time at St. Patrick's, including Gulliver's Travels. Straight ahead is St. Christ Cathedral. Nice big church. And on the left, that's the Viking Museum. And right behind me, it's 
straight ahead to the left, that's where you go to St. Patrick Cathedral. So all the landmarks pretty much close to each other. That's the right museum. The Vikings settled in Dublin from 841 AD onwards. During their reign Dublin became the most important town in Ireland as well as a hub for the Western Viking expansion and trade. The Vikings ruled with an iron fist for almost three centuries before being defeated at Clontarf. You don't have to look too far to see the marks left by these fierce invaders. Christchurch and Woodkey are the two main Viking settlements in Dublin and a good place to kick off a trip back in time. It was one day wars. Strongbow. This excavation took place on Ship Street beside Dublin Castle in March 2020 and investigated a 12th century medieval quarry and a 19th century police station. This is a Christ Church Cathedral. Ride the bell. The Cathedral of the Holy Trinity, or Christ Church as it's known, was built in 1030 by the King of Dublin Vikings, Citriac Silkwood, with the help of a young Irish priest, Dunon. Originally, it was a wooden church on the outskirts of Dublin's Viking settlement. It has been a place of pilgrimage for almost 1,000 years. The Christ Church Cathedral Dublin is the oldest building in continuous use in the entire city. Over the next thousand years, the church was ruined, rebuilt and restored many times. Today, Dublin's Christ Church Cathedral draws hundreds of thousands of visitors a year. The construction here began in the year 1030 with a small Nordic-style church. However, the new conquerors wouldn't stay in charge for long. By the 12th century, the weakened Vikings were overthrown by a new Anglo-Norman invasion. Once again, with the new rulers came new rules and consequently a new church. Mostly destroyed by the latest invaders, little of the Viking church remains today. Slowly rebuilt by the Anglo-Normans, most of the cathedral you see today dates from the 12th and the 13th century. In 1539, King Henry VIII decided to marry and bull in, however, the Pope had other ideas. Because the Pope wouldn't grant Henry an annulment of his already existing marriage, the King took a radical step. He would sever all ties with the papacy and instead establish a brand new religion. In this religion, called Anglicanism, the king would be the head of the new church. Conveniently, this also meant he would be able to grant a divorce to himself and so a new religion was born. New religion means new rules and the king has to start the conversion somewhere. At the time, St. Patrick's Cathedral was the Cathedral of Dublin. Rather than dealing with the conservative clergy at St. Patrick's, the King took a shortcut and converted Christ Church to Christ Church Cathedral. The newly christened cathedral was the first place in all of Ireland to carry out an Anglican service. More than 500 years later, the ghost of Henry VIII would be back at Christ Church Cathedral Dublin. As you walk through the cathedral, you'll notice many unusual details. Many of these date from the 19th century. In 1560, to the roof above the cathedral collapsed, taking with it the richly decorated windows and floor tiles. However, in the 19th century, these were restored using medieval designs and techniques. One unusual feature of the cathedral is the decorative animals you'll find here. Among them, 
A 13th century carved monkey sits on top of a pillar. The church's strong connection with the animal kingdom means that the bishop conducts an annual blessing of the animals within the sacred walls. For this rite, locals and tourists bring their favorite pets to church. The animals receive special earthly treats and a prayer service. When you visit, see how many animals you can find within the church's architectural details and decorations. St. Lars Hort. St. Lorenzo Tool is the patron saint of Dublin. After buried in France in 1180, his harp was sent to Christ Church. The harp lay in the church for the next 800 years, secure in its place. But, one night in 2012, a thief entered the church in broad daylight and hid until after closing time. It's right here inside. Then, the police believe, they used cutters to remove the stone heart from the metal box where it was kept. For the next six years, the heart dropped off the face of the earth. An international hunt consisting of the Garda Irish Police, the Catholic Church Police, the Interpol and the MI6 turned up no results. But one day, the police in Dublin received a phone call. The caller said, you will find the heart in Phoenix Park. The police rushed over to Dublin's Phoenix Park and sure enough, they found the heart. That's the tumble of one Vikings. Richard Declare. The strong ball, Tom. He was on the Lears, captured Dumbling. Back in 1170. He was buried in the church in 1176. In 1562, the original tumble was destroyed when the ceiling fell off. In 1170, Lord Richard Declare, nicknamed Strongbow, came to Ireland from Wales. He brought archers, knights and horsemen with him and helped De Amuig to capture Waterford and Dublin. Amen. The most interesting part of Christ Church Cathedral lays deep below the ground. Here, in the largest crypt in Ireland, you'll find a wealth of history, treasures and weird artefacts. When the crypt was constructed in the 11th century, it quickly became a centre of Dublin trade. Within the crypt, you'll find a variety of memorabilia from the, the Tudors, including the stunning costumes. On display in the one place Henry VIII just can't seem to escape. Of the many treasures hidden deep within the crypt, perhaps the most famous is the Irish Magna Carta. In the 1860s, the workers remodelling the Christ Church Cathedral organ came upon these two strange figures. It looks like the animals were killed and then mummified while in the middle of a chase. It looks like nobody won in this one. They have been on display in Christ Church's crypt ever since. In the 1600s, the Christ Church Cathedral was also the Royal Chapel of England. And so, to celebrate victory on the battlefield, King William III and Queen Mary presented a royal plate to the cathedral. The plate was a religious offering from kings to show religious devotion and gratitude for the victory. The 1777 plate collection, Christ Church Cathedral. All this is gold and silver. All you need, it is exactly three days to know well Dublin. And the three more days you can take to explore the different cities nearby, like Belfast and uh, other cities. That's where we're gonna find, you know, the big castles and uh, more about the Irish history. So three days are enough to know Dublin, to explore Dublin.